Hey guys, welcome back to another Facebook Live broadcast. My name is Sarah King. I'm a Parkinson's physical therapist and founder of Invigorate Physical Therapy and Wellness here in Austin, Texas. And I help people diagnosed with Parkinson's create their own personalized Parkinson's plan of attack um, that helps empower you to get back in the saddle of your diagnosis. I know being diagnosed with Parkinson's can feel very disempowering and scary. And so these broadcasts are designed to help give you information to create your own plan of attack and go out into the world and execute it so that you can live a life full of vitality and energy. And when I'm coaching people through their Parkinson's plan of attack, it often includes things outside of physical therapy, which is why I'm really excited to talk with you guys today about speech therapy for Parkinson's. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. And as you're listening and filing in here, just give me a thumbs up um, or a sad face or an angry face if any of these questions resonate with you. I want you to give me a, some type of reaction. Let me know if you are ever asked to repeat yourself or maybe you're asked to repeat yourself often. Um, does your voice sound hoarse, scratchy, or breathy? Does your family often tell you that you speak too softly? Do you clear your voice, clear your throat often, rather? Is your voice strong on some days, weak on some other days? Or do you cough when you eat or drink? If you answered yes to any of those questions, I want you to stick around because I have an awesome guest here to give you a little insight as to what could be going on to talk to you a little bit more about how speech therapy could potentially benefit you. If you answered yes to any of those questions, you're a perfect candidate for speech therapy. And um, we'll even dive into some exercises, some tips, and some strategies that you can use immediately to help you with some of those um, challenges. So Samantha Elandri is a speech therapist. She's a founder and CEO of Parkinson Voice project whose mission is to increase effective um, increase access to effective speech therapy services for people diagnosed with Parkinson's. And Samantha created an innovative and intensive two-part speech therapy program called the Speak Out program that focuses on speaking with intent. And I'm going to let her tell you a lot more about it. I'm going to bring her on here in a second. Um, and let you ask your questions. So if you're tuning in, um, let us know in the comment section below. Give us a like or a heart and say hello. Put your questions there too because she's going to do a little Q&A at the end to answer your questions. And if you've submitted questions for Samantha, we've collected them and we're going to ask her those too. So um, thank you to everyone who posted your questions for Samantha. Um, we're definitely um, going to be responsive to those. So without further ado, let me change things up here and bring on Samantha to say hello. There she is. Let's zoom in a bit. Here she is. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. This is kind of fun. I've, I've never done this before, and I can see all the little thumbs up and everything. So this is this Yeah. Is it's super fun. You know, and the thing that I really enjoy about it is it's a conversation between two people who are in the Parkinson's world, but we also get to interact with everyone who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's, who's been affected by Parkinson's, um, so that it's not just me and you having dialogue. We actually get to incorporate the Parkinson's community, which I think is something that is potentially missing from a lot of um, education platforms. Actually, not missing from the one that you provide, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, I, as everyone who's watching, we'll talk about this a little bit later down the line, but. Um, Samantha actually invited me to speak at her facility um, outside of Dallas in August, and I'm really excited to do that. She's got an amazing program up there, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about it here in a second. But let's start off maybe general for people who are tuning in who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. They may or may not know about speech therapy for Parkinson's. So most people are struggling with voice issues, swallowing, um, feeling like they have too much or too little saliva. So how much does medication help with some of those symptoms? And why is speech therapy maybe um, a complement or a, a different solution to some of those uh, challenges? Well, it's been well documented that up to 90% of 
people with Parkinson's uh, will struggle with their speech sometime during the course of their illness. It's even, um, I don't know that you would say it's more important, but probably more important is that the muscles we use for speaking are the muscles we use for swallowing. And aspiration pneumonia has been documented as the main cause of death in people with Parkinson's, accounting for 70% of the mortality rate. So this is a really serious, serious issue. Medications help in terms of making us feel better, right? Helping people with Parkinson's feel better, but they don't really have any effect on the voice. In fact, some treatments for Parkinson's can even impact the speech and the swallowing in a negative way. For example, some people who have had deep brain stimulation may find that they have even more difficulty with their speech after the surgery. So speech therapy is crucial. Everybody with Parkinson's should at least have a speech evaluation. I mean, 90% risk of having trouble. So we definitely want to address it. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people will probably be shocked by some of those numbers because um, a lot of, I, in my experience as a physical therapist, when I talk to people about their speech uh, challenges, not everyone associates their speech challenges with Parkinson's and maybe the voice, yes, but some of the swallowing or the coughing um, or the hoarseness or the breathiness, um, they might not make that direct connection. And so it's prevalent, those challenges are prevalent, but speech therapy is, in my opinion, underutilized. And that can be for a variety of reasons. There's not a practitioner that's close to them, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, or they aren't really sure what the benefits might be. And I know that a lot of people have heard of LSVT Loud, mm -hmm. um, the loud voice therapy. If you guys have um, had LSVT Loud or you're familiar with it, just give me a thumbs up. Um, most people have heard of that program. So your program, which is called the Speak Out program and the Loud Crowd um, at the Parkinson Voice Project is another strategy. So can you tell us maybe what the similarities are between the Loud, LSVT Loud and Speak Out and maybe what some of the differences are? Oh yeah, definitely. So first let's go back to why people with Parkinson's may not um, recognize the speech deficits or associate those with Parkinson's. So as you know, there's a sensory deficit related to Parkinson's uh, where things appear larger, louder or so than they really are. Um, Parkinson's is characterized by smaller movements, smaller walking, smaller writing, smaller voice. But and you can tell me this if, if you think this is what it is with physical therapy. You know, if somebody falls down or they trip over a curb, they go, wow, I, I have a problem. You know, I've got, I need to go do some physical therapy. But when somebody is sitting down in a restaurant and they're ordering their food and the waitress goes, I'm sorry, what, what, what was that? And they go ahead and they point to their menu. The moment passes without any bruises or wounds or anything like that. And it's just kind of um, maybe that's one of the reasons that we don't, that people don't think of it in, in terms of the speech, you know, because it happens, you have to repeat yourself and then the moment passes and then that's it. But um, so it is very important. Um, I like to recommend that people leave themselves a voicemail message maybe using their cell phone or call their spouse if they want to hear what their voice sounds like to other people. Um, I know when people come in for a speech evaluation at Parkinson Voice Project, the first thing we do is we video record them. And then we audio record them. And we audio record them speaking in conversation. We have them read something. We have them speak with intent so they can hear the difference. And, and really, people are quite shocked when they hear themselves on the recorder, they go, well, no wonder my spouse won't hear me or, you know, they're, they're really, really surprised by it. Yeah. So the Lee Silverman voice treatment and speak out. I, I was certified in the Lee Silverman treatment in 1997. So I'm very familiar with the program. I did conduct it for 13 years and it's an effective program. Um, the reason the speak out was developed in 2010 is that Lee Silverman um, they've done a lot of research on it. I mean, it's been around for 30 years. They have um, dozens of research articles that have been written on it. Uh, but it's a very um, string, stringent schedule. That's the main reason. 
with the Medicare therapy caps, which now finally they're no longer in place, but for 20 years they were in place, people were restricted on how much therapy combined, physical therapy and speech therapy combined they could receive. And the Lee Silverman voice treatment required 16 one-hour therapy sessions. It was hard for people to be able to. We found uh, people all over the country having to pick, do I want physical therapy or do I want speech therapy? And then, of course, they would pick physical therapy. So Parkinson uh, and then the so Parkinson Voice Project set out to try to find, uh, we call it a, a, a practical approach to treating Parkinson's, an approach that is more efficient, that where people can um, achieve good results, remarkable results, in fewer, shorter sessions so that it would comply with the insurance. LSVP is about thinking loud. Now, they call it the loud program, and I think people have a negative connotation to loud, and that's not really what LSVP Global, they're not wanting people to speak loudly. They're trying to, they're trying to address the sensory deficit where people think they're loud so that they'll sound normal. So um, I do want to say that because it's not that they're asking people to speak in a loud voice, although it's been it's become known as the loud program. So I think people think of it. But people don't want to be loud. People just want to be heard. So hmm. our program, Speak Out, is based on the teachings of Dr. Daniel R. Boone, who is a speech language pathologist, who in the late 1950s discovered or he recognized that when people with Parkinson's used intention when they were deliberate and purposeful in their speech they were louder clearer their vocal quality was clear their articulation was better they had more expression not just in their voice but in their facial you know their facial expression was better so speak out the uh our premise is to speak with intent to um to put forth more effort when we're speaking both LSVT and Speak Out are, boast, are based on intention. It's just that LSVT uses that word loud, and we use the word intent. I think that the thing I like about it is that intent can be applied to everything we do in our lives. All of us need to live with intent, right? But for people with Parkinson's, what's really happening, and then this is one neat thing that Dr. Boone taught my staff and myself. You know, for 13 years, I conducted LSVT, and I didn't. Really, I could help patients get better. They made great results. But I didn't quite understand what was happening. Like, why did it work so well? And I think that's what Daniel R. Boom helped me and my staff. We have two motor systems. We have the pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal system. We can think of it as the intentional system and the automatic system. For people with Parkinson's, because of the depletion of dopamine, automatic motor movements are disrupted. They don't work well. So anything that used to be automatic for somebody with Parkinson's is, is going to be affected. Um, this includes speech. We don't think about it, but speaking is an automatic behavior. As I'm speaking to you, I'm not thinking about the breath I'm taking in. I'm not paying attention to where my tongue is and my lips. I'm not saying, oh, I'm about to say the K sound. Let me lift the back of my tongue in make that sound, it's all happening. I'm even taking the breath that I need. Um, I don't have to think about the breath depending on how long my utterance is gonna be. I, I'm just talking. Well, it's an automatic behavior. So when we use intent, we're not using the automatic motor, motor system. We're using the intentional one. The intentional motor system does not necessarily interact with the area of the brain where dopamine is produced. And that's why it works. So people with Parkinson's can be speaking in a soft voice, can be mumbling, have a scratchy voice. And then you tell them, I want you to speak out. I want you to talk like you're the boss. How would you talk if you were the president? And all of a sudden, their speech comes out clearer, louder. It's all about intention. Um, so again, similar to LSVT in terms of loud is just one way to speak with intent. You know, in the brain, they're both doing the same things. The other thing that I recognized a long time ago is that even though, so this is important to know, that because the automatic system doesn't work well, when people go through therapy with Parkinson's, they are not, it's never going to be habitual. It will never be automatic. So 
same for physical therapy. People with Parkinson's need ongoing physical therapy, speech therapy. They're never going to graduate from therapy. And that's why Parkinson Voice Project's program is two-part. Speak Out helps strengthen all the muscles we use for speaking. It can also improve the swallowing. And then it also, we're teaching them about intent. It's amazing. You know, if you go on the internet and look, you read everything, you know, you're progressive, degenerative, incurable. Nobody's talking about intention. People really, mm -hmm. you do. I can mm -hmm. the website. That's why I want you to come speak. That's why I'm excited that you're coming in August. But why is it that, that other organizations and so are not talking about intent? People with Parkinson's really have more control over their speech and their walking and everything they do. But the problem is it will never be automatic. So our program is two parts. Patients come to us, they go through about 12 therapy sessions. Most people finish the program in 10 to 12 therapy sessions. Um, and then when they finish Speak Out, they transition to the second part, which is the loud crowd, which is the maintenance part of the program. And that's crucial. Somebody could go through 100 speech therapy sessions, but if they don't keep up with the exercises, it's going to drop off. That's just the way it is because it's never going to be automatic. And one way I like to explain it to my patients is, you know, if I were treating a child who had an articulation problem, let's say a, I treat a child who can't say her R's. Well, my whole goal for that child is for the R, the production of R, to be automatic. And so once done with therapy, she's finished. She never needs it again. It's not that way with Parkinson's. They have to keep up with the exercises. And the Speak Out program is also based on a workbook that we developed at Parkinson's Voice Project. And there's 25 lessons in there. And there, it's a combination of speech, voice, and cognitive exercises. So by giving every patient, and we ship a workbook out to every Parkinson patient in the U.S. who is receiving Speak Out. We want every person to have the tools they need to learn how to speak with intent. But now it'll help them with their regimen and keep keep on track. That was a lot. Perfect. That was great. Yeah, I have. I'm keeping track of questions in my head as you go because um, I have obviously talked to you about Speak Out before, um, and there are a lot of unique things about it that I really love. And so um, the not only the training part where you see a therapist one on one, but the follow up to help with um, the ongoing maintenance. And you've set up a framework to help people with that ongoing maintenance. And if um, I know anything and the people watching um, will definitely agree um, that ongoing maintenance is really hard um, when you feel like you're doing it all by yourself. And so having something like a loud crowd and I have questions about it, um, it really, I think, helps with follow through. And I know that you're starting some research on uh, this Speak Out program. And I would just as a a thought that's going to flutter away if I don't say it, but it's, you know, what's the follow-up? What's the maintenance? What's the utilization of speech therapy over time when you actually have follow-through and support? Um, and I'd be curious about physical therapy as well, but all of you watching probably know how hard it is to follow through on your own. And that's why, you know, we've created these communities, a loud crowd for the Parkinson Voice Project. I know we have the invigorated community, which is our free community. Anyone watching who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's or affected by Parkinson's is welcome to join, but um, I just think that that's so fantastic that you do that. And so my first question, going back to the speak out portion, that first portion, um, is this all in-person training? Um, and our, let's start there. If this is all in-person or do you have telemedicine, kind of telehealth options as well? Okay, so for a person with Parkinson's, the first thing they wanna do is have a speech evaluation to determine what the best treatment is for them. And then if it's determined that speak out would be beneficial to the person, then what they would do is the first, uh, we have every patient go through an information session, a Parkinson's information session. Now, uh, we, I, want, I want to mention that our clinic is in Richardson, Texas, but we've trained speech pathologists all over the United States. And so you can go to parkinsonvoiceproject.org and there's a tab at the top that says patients and families, and you can find a speak out provider in your area. 
But the first step is to have an evaluation, then to go through the information session. You can either watch a 14-minute video that's on the homepage of our website or the Speak Out providers that we've trained may be offering their own information session. We think it's crucial. People, before they start therapy, they need to understand about intent. They need to know that they can get better, so they have to have hope. Yeah. They need to know what's expected. They're going to be doing exercises every day. They're going to be using this workbook, and then they're going to need to transition to the loud crowd. So they need to know up front what, what is it going to take. After the information session or after the evaluation, they can order their workbook. Like I said, we, uh, we're a nonprofit organization. So we have donors who have contributed money to provide the Speak Out workbooks to every person in the United States who's receiving Speak Out. So we want to order that workbook, get it off to the person, and then they start therapy. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's um, Normally it can be offered in two or three times a week. Most places it's offered three times. So really it all depends on the patient, what the patient needs. And that's another difference between LSVT and Speak Out. LSVT, very researched uh, program, uh, but because of the research was done with patients coming four days a week for four weeks. You see, so that's the regimen for it. Where Speak Out is uh, you evaluate the patient and you determine what would be best for them. But people with Parkinson's do need intensive exercise. So even though a patient may only see us three days a week, they're doing exercises every day. I would imagine it would be the same with physical therapy. When mm -hmm. there's at first, they need to be more. Yep. As far as telemedicine, as speech language pathologist, we have to be licensed in the state where the patient lives in order to okay. provide telemedicine. So um, I can treat somebody in Texas via telemedicine. I prefer to see the patient in person at least a couple times, make sure they're a good candidate for the treatment, and then we can do some sessions uh, via telemedicine. But it is one-on-one -on -one therapy. Okay, perfect. And if you're watching and you're wanting to find a Speak Out provider, there's a way to search for providers on the Parkinson Voice Project website, which will make sure there's a link to that resource either in the comment section below or somewhere around this video, depending on where you're watching it. But we'll make sure that you can go and search to see if there's a Speak Out provider in your area, which um, they train providers and it sounds like you're training more and more people um, all over. So there's a good chance that there are providers in um, people and viewers area. How many do you know that I didn't preface you with this question, but do you know how many therapists you have trained okay. total in the Speak Out period? Therapists, but I how many? that last holiday season we received a million dollar challenge grant so we raised a million dollars a loud crowd family was going to match it and we met the challenge so we just recently awarded 90 grants to 90 different speech therapy clinics around the united states so in the next few months all of these therapists are doing the training now so in a, a few months you're going to see the provider listing there's going to be more providers. We have lots of university speech therapy clinics um, that were awarded grants, and so people with Parkinson's will be able to go to those clinics and receive both Speak Out and the Loud Crowd. But all of the training is going on now. There are therapists already trained. They're on our website, but you're going to see that number increase significantly in the next few months as they complete their training. That's awesome. And if um, someone's familiar with a speech therapist now that might not be speak out provider, what do you, could could someone with Parkinson's go to their speech therapist and say, hey, you should check this out? How does that work? Okay. Uh, well, we have an online course for speech language pathologists. It's uh, 10 hours of continuing education. The cost is $289. And once the person, once the therapist goes through training, we also give them a speak out therapy kit. So we have donors who have paid for these kits. So when the speech pathologist is trained, they're going to receive all the materials they need in order to help their Parkinson's community get better. And that's the big thing with speech therapy, unfortunately. The reimbursement rate is so low with Medicare that those of us, you know, when we were working, in, well, I say I used to work in a hospital. Now I'm at Parkinson's Voice Project. But you know, there wasn't a lot of funding there or a lot of support from the administration just because the reimbursement rate is so low. I mean, we're not the big money makers in the hospital. So 
Parkinson Voice Project thought it was so important that we provide the patients with the tools they need, which is why we give them the workbook, and give the speech pathologist the training at a reasonable rate, and then give them the therapy materials. We don't want to say, okay, here's here's how you do speak out. And by the way, for an extra five hundred dollars, you can. Yeah. No, we have donors. We went out, we raised the money, and we're going to give the kits to the speech pathologist. And that way they'll have the tools they need to help the people in their area to get better. That's great. So you've kind of touched on it, but how um, how is the Speak Out program paid for? If someone wants to go through the program, what's the payment like? What's the cost? What's the Tell us about that process a little bit. So if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you can come to Parkinson Voice Project, and we have not charged anyone for therapy since 2008. So we don't bill wow. Medicare, we don't bill insurance, we don't charge patient, patients. Our program has been funded entirely through donations and the pay it forward system. So if you come to our clinic to receive treatment, you're gonna get all the treatment you need. And then at the end of treatment, we're going to give you an opportunity to make a donation to help the next person go through treatment. But all of the other providers, all the other people we train throughout the US, they're billing insurance. So they would bill Medicare or, or or other private insurance, just like they would for any other kind of speech therapy. There's no special code for Speak Out, just like there's no special code for LSVT. It's just billed as a speech evaluation and speech therapy. Awesome. Okay. That's really great information. Um, so people who are watching can go to parkinsonvoiceproject.org and learn more about it, see if there's a provider in your area. Um, and we'll talk about a few other services that you guys provide um, via your website um, here maybe in a little bit at the end, because I know a lot of people who are tuning in do have problems with um, voice volume and feeling hoarse, having too much saliva, having not enough saliva, coughing, you know. And so I want people to be able to walk away from this Facebook Live with some strategies that they can use right away. So. I gave you a little bit of prompt that I was gonna ask you these. So we've got a couple categories. We have, we're gonna talk about swallowing, we're gonna talk about speaking louder, we're gonna talk about excessive drool or maybe dry mouth in the same vein, and then feeling hoarse or scratchy. And some of these might overlap a little bit, but for those of you who are watching, that's what's coming up. And the first thing I wanna ask about is swallowing. You said that aspiration is incredibly common, it's really dangerous, and so it's really important um, so do you have any tips for people who have difficulty swallowing and, um, how do people know when they need a swallow test? Well, the, the first thing, if anybody is noticing any swallowing difficulty, and this can be, um, a food feeling like it's getting stuck in the throat, having trouble controlling the food in, in your mouth. For example, I treated a patient who said, well, I just love peanut M&Ms. Every time I eat peanut M&Ms, they end up in my, you know, in, in my cheeks and, and everywhere. So that would be like not having good control um, over it. Um, coughing when eating or drinking, either when, when you're eating or drinking or soon after, feeling like pills are getting stuck or food is getting stuck. So those are some of the, the symptoms of Parkinson's. I mean, of swallowing with Parkinson's. So the first thing is to have an evaluation by speech language pathologist. And then speech therapy is so important, right? So we need to do speech therapy, um, whether it's the LSVT or speak out, right? Because we're not all over the US and LSVT is not, we've got to find someone. The main thing is that you want to work with a speech pathologist who knows about Parkinson's, who understands that people with Parkinson's can get better and who understands the difference between automatic and intentional. That, that would be really important. A, a swallow evaluation is called a modified barium swallow study. That is like a video of the swallowing. It's conducted by a speech language pathologist in a radiology department. So it's as an outpatient. You don't have to be an inpatient for it. And what they do is they mix up food and liquid with barium and they watch you swallow it. So when, you know, we can't see through the throat, right? <laughs> so in order to evaluate the swallowing, it's like a movie, it's like an x-ray, and uh, we can see what's happening. Is it getting stuck? And then we can try some different strategies. Does it help when you tuck your chin or turn your head? Um, is there a difference when somebody takes smaller bites 
versus larger bites. So they'll try all of that during the modified bearing swallow study to see if, um, if any of those strategies will help. But the, the big thing is, we'll go back to um, Parkinson's is characterized by smaller movements. So we think of walking, small steps, but it's smaller, it's smaller movements everywhere. The way the tongue moves, the way the mouth moves. When we're trying to initiate a swallow, the movements are small. Right, so we've got to use intent. We have to put more effort when we're swallowing, and um, speech therapy is, is crucial. What we yeah. do in the Voice Project, if somebody is having some mild, mild to moderate swallowing difficulty, we'll go ahead and go through speak out first. Then, if the if the person is still having trouble, then we will refer them to a mod for a modified bearing swallow study afterwards. Okay. And we have more of swallowing issues. Sometimes speech therapy will take care of it. Sometimes it won't. You know, there's still a lot of research also that needs to be done on swallowing. It's so tricky because when you do the swallow, the other thing, the problem with it is when you do the modified bearing and swallow study, uh, were the medications working at the time you went in? Were you tired at the, at the specific time that that swallow study was done? Was Is it done in the, the afternoon when you're tired or are you... You have more energy in the morning, or is it switch? It's, it's so inconsistent. It's why it's mm -hmm. really hard to, to tell what's going on. But definitely, we want to keep them, we want to get the muscles as strong as possible. Yes. And speaking of getting muscles as strong as possible, do you have one exercise that you might be able to tell us about or demo even to help if someone is having trouble with any of those swallowing issues that you mentioned? The swallowing issues, I don't want to give swallowing exercises because they're really so different. For example, um, I mentioned, you know, tucking your chin. Well, I've actually done a modified bearing swallow study where somebody aspirated when they tuck their chin. So you don't want to just pick it yeah. up and do that. I could give you some speech. I can give you something very simple to do, people can do for speaking. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that in a second. Um, is there anything that's, oh, go ahead a tip for uh, drooling okay we'll get there we'll get there um we'll do all of that is there anything that strengthens the muscles in the swallowing muscles that's kind of safe to suggest speech therapy okay no general exercise like stick your tongue out or well i would say if some people are having swallow. swallowing their pills they could try taking them with applesauce they put the pill okay. on the applesauce that could help them to do that um, also, okay. point out the pharmacist to see if the pill can be cut in half. But applesauce tends to help a lot of people to, to get the pills down, eating slower, alternating liquids and solids, you know, trying to take small bites and take a tiny sip of, of water afterwards. Also, mm -hmm. to journal and see what kind of foods are giving you trouble. Um, so, if you can try to pinpoint exactly what it is. I had a funny story one time. I um, had a person who said, oh, I'm having swallowing trouble. So he came in and I'm feeding him applesauce and little bites of everything. And I mean, I don't see anything. He's not coughing. He, he looks fine. And then all of a sudden he goes, well, I don't understand. Every time I take the two liter bottle of Pepsi out of my fridge and drink it like this, <laughs> I start coughing. <laughs> and then I asked him a little bit more. He goes, well, you know, I start coughing when I eat carrots and popcorn and peanuts and things like that, but that's uh, not any trouble. You know? yeah. But trying to figure out what uh, what is causing the trouble. Um, I also think, um, I don't know if this is along the same lines, but eat, going out to dinner, you know, it takes so much concentration for somebody with Parkinson's just to be eating. I think being very mindful when you're going out, especially with friends when you're going to be talking and eating at the same time, to think about what kind of restaurant you're going to and where, what you're eating. For example, eating mashed potatoes is going to be a lot easier than eating a baked potato. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would be easier than spaghetti in terms of manipulating it and feeding and all of that, so that you can enjoy the conversation without having to struggle with the food. That's not exactly swallowing. But I mean, it is has to do with eating and all of that. I mean, there's lots of lots of different tips. But as far as the physical swallowing exercises, I would say do the speech exercises. And if that's okay. not 
talk to the speech pathologist because we don't want everybody. There's some swallowing exercises that are really hard to do. Mm -hmm. One of them I have a hard time. Stick your tongue out and then swallow. Yeah, there you go. Try. One it. of my clients told me to do that, and I was I was stuck for about five minutes. My brain couldn't get a, a hold of it. So hard. I have I have people come in all the time. Okay, this is what I do for my swallowing. Well, yeah. That's necessarily the best it's hard to do i mean even yeah about parkinson's so a speech with all we only want it we only want to do exercises that we have to do <laughs> right right and for those of you watching we kind of skipped over at the exercises well my is to stick your tongue out and then try and swallow or hold your tongue with your teeth and then try and swallow that is a challenge so um <laughs> And I wanted to ask you, because this brought up a, um, a question who um, one of my clients might actually be watching this. She had um, she worked with her caregiver when she would eat. Sometimes she would feel like something was stuck in her throat and her caregiver would take her arms and essentially lift them up over her head um, to kind of help. Um, and it helped made her feel like she could swallow a little bit easier, which I understand some of the biomechanics, you know, releasing your. Um, kind of some of your neck muscles and all that good stuff. Is that a good strategy? Do you recommend that to people? I'm not sure where this yeah. caregiver got it. I never heard of that before. I know when my kids would start coughing, I'd be like, raise your hands. You know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The motility can be slower. So people feel like it goes down, you know, slower. So taking a little sip of water, but definitely anything like that, a modified bearing swallow study should be done. Swallowing is uh, swallowing difficulties are life threatening. The thing that people have to watch out for also is called silent aspiration. It's deadly. Silent aspiration is when food or liquid or saliva is going down the wrong way, and the person shows no outer um, sign that anything is wrong. So the person doesn't cough. They don't choke, they don't clear their throat, they look like they're swallowing okay, but it's just going down the wrong way. That's called silent aspiration. I've had some patients who have had a swallow study and they go, I don't understand. They told me to change my diet and, and do all of this, but I think I'm fine. But the thing is, sometimes because of the sensory problems, something can mm -hmm. be going down the wrong way and the person doesn't feel it. And that's why it's really important if somebody coughs, you know, a few minutes after eating or 10 minutes after, maybe they're silently aspirating. And that's why we do the modified uh, bearing swallow study so we can see through. If somebody aspirates, we will see it. And then uh, during the study, we can try to determine are there certain consistencies that are better that, that don't get aspirated? It's really important. Yeah. If you guys are watching and you're not really fully grasping the importance of speech therapy for Parkinson's, I think um, that is. The illustration right there just it's more information i know that adding more um, healthcare providers to your team can sometimes feel like a hassle especially when maybe it's parkinson's isn't even the only thing you have going on um it can feel like oh speech therapy like maybe i'll do that later um, but really speech therapy can in the same way that physical therapy can help you um, strengthen your body, in this case, your mouth and um, you know all of your throat muscles and whatnot, can help prevent a lot of things down the line. Um, you know, catching aspiration pneumonia really early changes the course of the next you know few years of your life, really. So I'm obviously a big advocate of therapy and I think it prevents a lot of um, future complications if, really utilized early physical therapy and speech therapy, um, both. So thank you for answering those. I know that's a kind of tricky, tricky subject with swallowing um, and giving recommendations. Just see a, a speech therapist um, in the end. Yeah, I know it's kind of, I know it's very scary for people with Parkinson's to hear about the swallowing disorders. I mean, it's frightening. It really is. Um, but what I want everyone who's watching to know is that people with Parkinson's can get better. Speech therapy yeah. works. People with Parkinson's respond extremely well to speech therapy, physical therapy. And like I said, whether you do LSVT or whether you do speak out, you've got to do some intensive speech therapy, get the speech and swallowing muscles strong, but you also need the maintenance. You know, you need the loud crowd. You need to keep up with the exercises and with the depletion of dopamine, I mean, dopamine gives us that get up and go, right? 
we need that. And so people with Parkinson's really struggle with motivation. That's another reason the loud crowd is so important. You know what? All of us can use a loud crowd. I can. My loud crowd is for me too, right? And how many times have we started a diet or exercise program and we have a hard time keeping up with it or we're trying to just life in general, right? Everybody would benefit from a support group, right? But the loud crowd is focused on speech, of course, but it ends up being a, um, a, a support group and provides that camaraderie and, um, holds us accountable, right? Um, so all of those things are important. But it, uh, so we don't want to ignore the swallowing. I know it's scary to think about. We we don't want to ignore it, but we want to know that if we catch it early, there is a lot you can do about it. Yeah, early intervention is so key. Um, and hopefully, these videos are reaching people, you know, immediately after they're diagnosed or very early on in your diagnosis, um, so that you can utilize these services and really maximize their impact. So. My next category is about speaking louder. So um, do you have any tips for speaking louder or any exercises that you can share with people to speak louder? We tell people we want them to speak with intent. Right. With intent. Not, Not louder. Loud because you can speak softly with intent or you can speak loudly with intent. It's all about being purposeful and deliberate. So, um, of course, we want to see a speech language pathologist because every patient is different and they'll require, you know, different types, uh, different types of exercises or different intensity levels of the exercise. But something that everybody with Parkinson's would benefit from is to pick an object across the room, whether it's a, a picture frame or a clock or something, and to speak out. That's why our program is called Speak Out. So they could try things like counting, um, saying the days of the week, the months of the year. If somebody has a, their spouse or their grandkids, what would be really great is if somebody would say like three numbers, throwing them across the room, and then have the other person say the next three numbers. So if I were to do one, two, three, and then you come back at me with four, five, six, Mm -hmm. seven eight nine and you come back every time i stop i'm taking a breath hmm. problem with the speaking is the inability to coordinate the breathing counting re-coordinates the breathing pattern so one of the exercises that we do at parkinson voice project and we start with short so we go one two three stop four, five, six, stop. Okay, so you can do it by yourself and stop every three or with somebody else back and forth. But every time you stop, you're taking a breath again. But I also notice that I didn't do it choppy. So I didn't go one, two, three, not like that. I'm connecting one, two, three, stop and do the next. One patient said I do them in cursive. I do them smoothly. Yeah. One, two, three, stop, and then do it again. But it's all about projecting out, speaking out over the clock, over the frame. You can also do it with uh, the days of the week. Sunday, Monday, stop. Tuesday, Wednesday, all speaking out, up and over. So you're stronger. It's something people could do in their physical therapy. It, they could. They do with me. <laughs> we yeah. count aloud all the time. Yeah, always thinking up and over. And whenever you're talking to people, you're projecting your voice up and over. You're speaking out, right? Yeah. But always thinking about it. If if somebody with Parkinson's is speaking and it's and um, they're not putting forth any extra effort, then they're then it's not working. Speaking is an automatic system, and the automatic system doesn't work because of the depletion of dopamine. So mm -hmm. someone with Parkinson's should always feel that they're putting forth effort, even if they're whispering. Even if they're whispering, there are, if they use intent, their articulation will be better, and it'll be great. The other thing is, in terms of the swallowing and our ability to cough, think about this. In order to produce a, an effective cough, we have to be able to take the breath in. Hmm. Yeah. 
weak and you can't coordinate those muscles, then the cough becomes very weak. So if people are coughing, they're going, ah, uh, you know, they can't cough because these muscles have become weak. So counting days of the week, nursery rhymes, things like that are very easy. Anybody could do those, but definitely see a speech pathologist. Okay. That um, actually brings up a question that Burke had, who submitted a question. He asked about coughing. Um, so we'll just throw this question in here since, you know, we're talking about it. So he has, he says that he's lost the ability to cough. He feels like he needs to, but he can't muster it up. What is it simply a breathing issue or what other well, thoughts do you have about that? You no, know, to check with the doctor that, I would say in order to produce a cough, we have to take the air in and then contract contract the muscles. So it's the same thing. We It's the same process. That's why we say that when you go through speech therapy, you're helping the swallowing too, because it's all the same movements, air coming in and out. When we cough, <coughs> we're taking the air out. It's the same thing you do when you're talking. I'm wondering if Burke has a weaker voice also. Or he only notices in the in the cough. Well, he is one of my online clients, so I've never talked to him. I haven't heard his voice, but he's probably watching. He could probably tell us, Burke, if you're watching. Um, We've had you people who, who say who can't laugh anymore. Mm. They come in and say, "I have no laugh. I have no laugh." So we have a sign on one of our walls that says, "I can laugh again." Literally, I laugh happy but I laugh because now I can because when we laugh it's the same thing you are going in and out the coordination of the breathing okay that's huge for a lot of you guys watching um that's really really insightful I can't wait to ask you more of our questions we have so many good ones um so Burke hopefully that answered your question or if you have a trouble coughing it answered it anyone watching um so let's move into drool so you said you had a good um strategy or exercise for drool so this is my understanding of the drool, and this is the physical therapist's understanding, so let me know where I'm off on this, but from what I understand, um, saliva production can actually decrease with Parkinson's medications, and some of the um, strategies, or the difficulty with drooling comes from lack of swallowing. It's not actually more saliva, it's just the, the decrease in the swallowing. Um, but people get injections to decrease their saliva production, which is already going to be decreased from the Parkinson's medication. So there's this interplay of you may actually be producing less saliva, but drooling more, or maybe you only feel like you have dry mouth at night, but, you know, talk to us a little bit about saliva, what happens, and then any tips and strategies you have for people who are struggling with it on either end. So I'm not aware that people with Parkinson's would produce less saliva. I think people with okay. Parkinson's produce as much saliva as the rest of us, but they feel like they produce more <laughs> because they have, they're drooling, okay? So what it is is that swallowing is an automatic behavior, just like the speech. We swallow several times, hundreds of times throughout the day, and we're not really aware of it. It's an automatic function. And so like we said, with the depletion of dopamine, anything that was automatic is now disrupted. So the person with Parkinson's, because their automatic system isn't working as well as it used to, they are not swallowing like every, everybody else. So they have to intentionally make themselves swallow. So the reason they have so much saliva is that it's building up in their mouth because they're not swallowing because swallowing now has to be an intentional behavior. Speech therapy helps with that. When I mentioned about yelling across the room, projecting your voice out, the reason, another reason I want it to be out is because we open our mouth more when we're trying to project up and over. So if I go, one, two, three, I'm moving my mouth more. These muscles will get stronger, and we need that, not just for speaking, but for swallowing, for chewing our food, and for, to control the, to hold the saliva in our mouth. Um, one thing that people can do, and well, the other problem is that we know that people with Parkinson's can kind of sometimes tend to have a stooped posture, their head down. 
So of course, gravity is going to pull that saliva out too. Uh, one little tip that a lot of my patients do is chew, um, chew sugar-free gum. Because when you chew gum, you swallow. It just makes you swallow. And you, you know, you don't really have to think about it. You just tend to swallow more. Could also make a point of swallowing before you start talking. But out of 130 patients that received speak out, 60% said that they noticed a reduction in the drooling. So again, getting all these muscles stronger, the whole system will help the breathing, um, the articulation, the vocal quality, um, the inflection patterns, um, and can potentially help the swallowing, being able to chew the food better, being able to move it from the front of the mouth to the back of the mouth. And that Okay. And something else, since we're, since we're talking about drooling, and, and the medications can tend to make the mouth dry. And maybe other medications are going to make the mouth dry. So it's important that people with Parkinson's drink plenty of water. I also want to mention that there have been a number of studies done that show that, that, that poor oral health can be a main cause of aspiration pneumonia, too. The bacteria from our mouth is actually more dangerous for the lungs than food and liquid. It is important that people are seeing the dentist regularly. A dry mouth would would be uh, would have um, hold more bacteria, so it's important mm. uh, for that too. Okay, yeah. When I was gathering questions for this Facebook Live. Um, a lot of people said that they, and I think I saw Mammy maybe in the comments a few moments ago said that um, the issue with the dry mouth is mostly at night. It's some people have that issue during the day, but most people it sounds like have that issue at night. When clients tell you that, do you have any strategies? You just said drinking water helps with dry mouth. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts about really dry mouth at night? Maybe they're sleeping um, with their mouth open. So how about using a humidifier at night? Try that. Just keep some moisture in the air. Mm -hmm. When somebody has a sore throat or a cough, and you know it, it, that, that dry cough, if you sleep with a humidifier, sleep with the head elevated a little bit, maybe that would help. If it's only happening happening at night, I would imagine they're sleeping with their mouth open. Okay. Drinking enough water during the day, you know, okay. cough, that too, but a humidifier. I would try that. Okay. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Um, and this next one does have to do um, with, maybe it has to do with lubrication in your mouth. I'm not quite sure, but a lot of people mentioned that they feel like they have a hoarse or scratchy voice. Um, and so this probably correlates with speaking louder, but um, do you have any tips for people who specifically say that they feel hoarse or scratchy? So the interesting question would be, when people complain of a hoarse or scratchy throat, does it hurt? Most of the time, it doesn't. So most of the time, the scratchy, hoarse throat in Parkinson's is not actually scratchy or hoarse. It's something in the speech pathology world we call glottal fry. And it all has to do with the breath support for speech. Another thing that is affected by not a not good breath support for speech. So I can make myself, let me see if I can do it. I can make myself soft and throttle. And so the re so it's it's a very relaxed way of talking. I'm not having to take a breath when I'm talking. It's just all coming from my throat. So as people start coming, they can talk, start talking from the bottle right. And it's not and you can say, does it hurt? Oh, it doesn't hurt at all. You know, it's like that, but it's the breathing. So when people start speaking with intent, when I say, well, let me hear your voice. I want you to say, how are you? All of a sudden, the scratchiness goes away. Why? Because they took a deep enough breath, the air came up, hit the vocal folds, and they projected it. So again, if somebody has a scratchy voice most of the time, but when they get angry, it clears up, it's a breathing problem. And if it doesn't hurt, so we have to say also to, you know, the scratchy throat in Parkinson's is not like somebody who, who uh, yelled at a football game and got laryngitis. Okay, mm -hmm. somebody gets laryngitis if they try to yell again or speak more loudly, they can't. 
it won't come out the sound right but with people with parkinson's when they speak and they put more effort and they speak more loudly they sound better they articulate better they're clearer it's stronger the scratchiness went away mm -hmm. now somebody projects their voice and it still sounds scratchy i mean it won't clear up then they probably should see an ear nurse and throat doctor but for most people and i'm, I'm going to say 98 percent or so of the one patients i've treated when they put forth more effort the scratchiness goes away so it's really not scratching this is poor breath support for speech is what it is that's hurts. great insight if it hurts go to an ear nurse and throat doctor okay here's up when you yell one two three then it's not a it's not a voice problem it's not a vocal problem yeah okay <laughs> that's great that is not what i expected the answer to that question to be i'm floored i learned so much on these interviews okay um so i have three more um these are actually from questions from our audience so i'm going to kind of shift into these but i have um some people and one person who asked via um our q a sheet asking about stuttering and parkinson's so can you shed some light on why that happens and maybe um, some strategies to help overcome the stuttering. So the automatic system, okay, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that coordinates and controls automatic movements. Okay, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that controls and coordinates automatic movements. That includes the movements of the mouth and the tongue. Okay, dopamine controls and coordinates. So normally when we have stuttering with Parkinson's, it's like the person is speaking more rapidly than they, than they intend to. They don't have control. The, the lips and the tongue are not coordinated. We can also see it probably in physical therapy with the fascination with somebody, you know, kind of stuttering in their walk, right? So the way that we combat that is speech therapy. Um, just like in physical therapy, um, perhaps when that happens, maybe you tell the person to stop and reset. And we would do the same thing with the speech. When the stuttering starts, stop and then project your voice out with intent. So stop and then throw it out. Speaking out can help people with Parkinson's who are having those disfluencies. Um, so again, control. We need to gain control. The speak out exercises or LSVT exercises, they re-coordinate the breathing pattern, they give us control, but the hard part is it's never gonna be automatic. So especially somebody who has that stuttering, they're always going to have to focus on using intent. It will never be automatic. And that is so frustrating. If it wasn't for that, probably Parkinson's would be a lot easier to deal with. Now they can produce the intentional speech and make it clear and smooth, but they're gonna have to make that happen. It's not gonna happen automatically. They're gonna have to speak out every time they say something. And speech therapy will help them to get used to it. Yeah, the intention is, um, is everything in Parkinson's. And it's, like you said, the most frustrating thing because who wants to think about everything that they're doing all the time right. and partially it's incredibly empowering to okay. think you know there are things that I can do to change it even though it is frustrating um, so I definitely can empathize um, on that probably, point it's not easy but it's you know straightforward I guess probably the most frustrating for the spouses and the caregivers because we have so many people say, I don't understand. We went out to dinner with friends and his speech was great. He came home with me and it was terrible. You know why? Because he's using his automatic voice. He's walking automatically, doing everything automatically at home when we're comfortable, when we're just more relaxed. And that's that's hard. I mean, it's hard to be on all the time. We, we can't be. So um, uh, one of my patients told me about King's X. Are you old enough to know what King Sex is? I'm not old enough, thank goodness. But one of my <laughs> crowd members told me King Sex, I guess, uh, um, maybe our, our grandparents would play uh, Chase, or, and they would say King Sex, which is like a time, time out. So I actually like to give my patients a little bookmark that says King Sex, and they can give it to their huh. spouse. 
whenever they don't feel like using intent. <laughs> For the next hour, I need a break. I'm, I'm not going to speak with intent or do anything. Just I, I just need a, I need a break. I don't want you to remind me for the next hour. I just, King's X, time out. I love that. I am going to bookmark that. King's X, how many people watching as a, as a care partner or, you know, someone diagnosed with Parkinson's would love permission to just take a time out and have it be okay, you know, and have it be, all right, King's X, like, we just know that that's okay and we'll come so we'll circle back in an hour how many arguments and how many you know frustrations could that save um that's such a great idea okay all of us we all need a break sometimes so just yeah you know, it's very empowering i can choose to use my intentional voice or i can choose not to use my intentional Right. I just looked at the time. We're going on an hour. So I'm going to power through these last two questions. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us. Um, you can put your comments in the comment section below, your questions. Um, Lauren's feeding them to me. So I'm going to continue to ask Samantha here as long as she'll um, she'll let me. But um, if you have to go, I understand. Come back and check out the comments. You can watch the replay later. Um, so I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. But these are really, really important questions. And um, this next one is about... I'm going to combine maybe a few things because I see uh, Tina actually submitted a question and she's asking about shortness of breath. Is shortness of breath when talking a period of time something that's normal? And um, I'm going to combine that with a question that I have for you. Um, decreased lung volume over time, I feel like really impacts people's ability to participate in activities, um, exercise and speech, um, be, being able to speak just because... Um, whether it's rigidity in your rib cage, those muscles around um, your rib cage, or um, just kind of decreased activity, your diaphragm maybe isn't as strong as it could be. Um, what recommendations do you have for people to who get out of breath when t speaking? Um, and any exercises to maybe help increase lung volume that or diaphragmatic strength or mobility? Um, with a caveat of if you have shortness of breath, you should probably get it checked out by a physician because it's not always just decreased lung volume. It could be something else, but right. the floor is yours. Yeah. So, you know, there, we have to make sure we know the difference between shortness of breath and decreased breath support for speech. If somebody's running out of air when you're talking, then there's a speech issue. Shortness of breath in general, when you're not talking, you probably want to talk to your doctor about that. But the main right. issue with speech in Parkinson's is the breath support. And it is the main problem. People who have had deep brain stimulation, I see shortness of breath more often with them. They really have a hard time coordinating their breathing. They're trailing off a lot. Maybe they can only, uh, some of them, I'm just saying some of them, not everybody. Some people with DBS don't have any speech problems. But those who do have noticed a difficulty with the uh PBS and the speech problems can be um, decreased breath support for speech and also the stuttering or the disfluency that's more frequent with the deep brain, uh, deep brain stimulation. But speech therapy will help all of that. When we're speaking out, it is impossible to speak out, to throw your voice across the room during your exercise routine. And I'm talking about vocal exercise. It's impossible to do that without taking a deep breath. So even though it says it's all about speaking with intent, what we're really doing is getting the breath support stronger. We're getting the lips and the tongue stronger. We're getting better movement of the vocal cords, uh, vocal folds. Um, breath support is, is, again, breath support for speech. Right. That's, uh, um, you know, other breathing issues they need to talk to their doctor. But again, that counting, what I mentioned, counting to three and stopping, and having to take another breath. And the other thing I want to mention, even though breath support for speech is the main issue with Parkinson's in terms of speech issues, uh, we don't we don't want to think about the breathing. So I want to tell your people, do not think about the breathing when you're doing that. Just think about speaking out. Yell those numbers out across the room. And that's your routine. I also think that people um, People tend to think about vigorous exercise. They think of like physical therapy or, or physical exercise. But for speech therapy, how do you get? How do you do? How do you exercise vigorously? You increase your volume. Right. 
Sometimes say, well, I can't do that. I feel like I'm yelling. Well, how else do you exercise all these muscles? That's how you get a good workout. All right, but you need to do it in a good way so you don't hurt your voice. And that's right. when everybody needs to work with a speech pathologist. Right. That's great. That's great um, feedback. Um, and I have so many questions. I'm going to keep it next to this next one is actually about singing, which will help us transition maybe into some of the other things that Parkinson Voice Project offers. So um, I'll ask my question here about singing in a second. But if you are in the Richardson, Texas area, obviously you have a clinic in Richardson, Texas, which is right outside of Dallas. Um, I'm in Austin, so it's, um, you know, like three hours north of me. What? And I'll be traveling there on August 11th. So if you guys are close and want to stop by and um, sit in for the lecture in person on August 11th, um, we're going to put a link somewhere around this video to help you register for that event. Um, well, you only register online, right? And you can just, can you just show up if in person without registering? You go to parkinsonvoiceproject.org. There's a place where you can either register to attend in person or we also live stream the lectures. So you okay. can watch from wherever, anywhere in the world, they can they can watch you. Yeah. We also put a recording up of all the lectures about a week later. So if they miss it um, on, on that day, they can watch it about a week later. It'll be up on our website. Yes. It's an amazing resource. Just thumbing through some of the webinars that they offer. I know a lot of you tune into things like this often. Um, we have a really motivated Parkinson's community. Those of you watching, this is probably not your first go round watching some type of live webinar. Um, and the Parkinson Voice Project just has so many other ones to watch about a variety of topics that have to do with Parkinson's. And they're all centered around this idea that people diagnosed with Parkinson's can get better, which is what I love and what um, sometimes I feel like I need to give people that caveat to know that what you're tuning into isn't going to send you into this depressive state for two weeks because it's a lot of fear mongering. You know, Parkinson Voice Project, incredibly optimistic. Um, just talk about living with intent with Parkinson's, which aligns obviously really, really well um, with Invigorate. So that brings me into my next question, because I know you guys have a lot of different offerings. You have the loud crowd. You also have, a, you're venturing into some sort of singing with Parkinson's, it sounds like. Um, and maybe you can expand on it a bit. But um, let me see who asked this question to give them a little shout out. Um, Chris Pesic asks, if one really applies himself, practices the exercises vocally, and is committed, can a singer sing again? The answer is yes, of course. <laughs> yes, well, we need speech therapy, though. Okay, I can't stress that enough. Um, so we have a singing program. We actually have the largest Parkinson's chorus in the world. No joke. Wow. We do, right in Richardson, Texas. Yeah. And actually, Dallas is across the street from us, so it's not really that far. So Dallas is there. But in 2006, we started our singing program with about – 15 people, but every fall we put on a show. This year the show will be on Saturday, September 8th at 2 o'clock p.m. Um, Central Time, and it's called Sing Out. We will have nearly 100 people with Parkinson's sing for a crowd of 1,000 people. And so uh, we host the show um, in a high school auditorium uh, there are no ringers on stage, okay? It's all people with Parkinson's who entered the program and were having, you know, trouble with their voice. They went to speak out, and now their voices are better. And we actually have some videos online where you can see people with Parkinson's singing, but the voice can get better, definitely. And I want to mention, I mean, and, and you can tell us if it's the same with physical therapy, but in terms of speech, it doesn't take long to see results. In about three or four days, the person with Parkinson's will be speaking better. It will not be automatic. We still need to get the muscles stronger. But sometimes, even after the evaluation, once people are, once they find out about intent, they just become empowered. They have hope. They're speaking better. But it does not take long to get it better. Now, to use intent in your everyday speaking. I'm going to tell you that honestly, it can take people about six months to two years 
to really get used to it. The improvement will be made very fast. Somebody will come in, they can't be understood, and a week later they can be understood. But to really ingrain that intent, to really get used to it, it happens usually about six months to two years. Sometimes somebody goes to speak out, they don't keep up with their exercises as much as we try to tell them. It's not going to be automatic. You're going to have to do this, you know, ongoing. What, unfortunately, what it takes sometimes is for that person to drop off on their exercises and the voice goes right back down. And then they come back in and they help them again. Which is one good thing about not charging for what we do because if we had to deal with insurance, maybe they used up all their insurance, maybe we can help them. But it's a struggle. But once it clicks, once they continue with the loud crowd and they get on a really good regimen, it would be great. And definitely the Definitely. Anybody out there right. wants that? Because I'm dying to treat her. What's that? Anybody out there? And do we have a personal friend of Linda Ronstadt? Because I'm dying to treat oh, her. Oh, you know, that's funny. I'm sure there's like only six degrees of separation or whatnot. I'm sure someone watching yeah. knows her. Um, so many people ask me about her. If you guys know her, connect with Samantha here. Um, okay, so that is let's see, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to try and put people's questions up here. Um, we're just doing a Q and a here guys. So, um, again, if you want to tune into my, um, presentation at Parkinson voice project, it's happening on August 11th. You can go to Parkinson voice project.org and, um, it's under Parkinson's lectures, I believe. And you can register for the webinar to live stream it, to watch from afar. Um, or you can come and see me. I would love to meet you in person. I have a lot of people who um, I've actually told about the, the event. So hopefully they'll be able to make it and I'll be there and we can um, we can chit chat in real life, as they say. So I'm going to throw up some questions here. If you guys have questions, um, Samantha, how much time we are over? Um, I'll be here all night. No problem. We'll be here all night. All right. Let's grab some popcorn. Nikki asks, I'm going to put it up here on the screen. She asks, coughing and sneezing fits, does it help? So I'm imagining speech therapy for coughing and sneezing fits. Gosh, I don't know about that. I have to talk to the doctor. Um, I know that people with Parkinson's can clear their throat more often. That's one of the early signs of a speech disorder related to Parkinson's is frequent throat clearing and coughing. So again, uh, when people go through speech therapy, they actually, uh, the throat clearing reduces. They have, more, they have more control here. I don't really actually know the reason for, for that much, but also the coughing, we have to be careful to make sure it's not a swallowing issue. Uh, actually, a runny nose when you're eating can be a sign of a swallowing problem. But I, and I know people have said that in the comments that they have runny nose when they're eating. I don't, so I don't know about the coughing and sneezing. But so speech therapy does help to reduce the throat clearing and reduce coughing. But I don't okay. know if it really fits. And also the lectures, just so people know, when they go to parkinsonvoiceproject.org, at the top it says education and events, and then they'll find the Parkinson's lecture series. Okay, perfect. Yeah, go wait till this is over, and then go over there and do it. Um, it'll be the description, the link to it will be somewhere around this video, depending when and where you're watching. But Lauren should put a comment in the comment section below right now for those of you who are watching so you can bookmark it. All right, let's do Richard's question. Um, Richard asks, I have mitochondrial disease as well as Parkinson's. Does that change therapy at all? So a lot of people, some people might not have mitochondrial disease. It's pretty specific, but um, are there any conditions that complicate speech therapy or is it the treatment is generally the same? Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not as familiar with this, so I wouldn't be able to do this, but I can tell you that anytime somebody has a speech evaluation, there are certain things that would tell us that we call it stimulability testing or how to determine whether somebody is a candidate for speak out. So I can give you that. If somebody can tolerate at least 30 minutes of therapy, um, they, when they speak with intent or when they project their voice, if their volume improves, or if they have at least two of these, their volume improves, the breath support seems to improve, their vocal quality is clearer, 
Um, their articulation is better. They, they have more expression in their voice. So if at least two of those things uh, improve, then we would say they were a candidate for Speak Out. Also, are they, um, will they be able to follow through with the home practice exercises? So Speak Out might be 10 or 12 therapy sessions, but for 25 days, the person is doing 15 minutes of speech exercises twice a day, following along in the workbook. So as long as they can do that, then they would be a good candidate. Um, I can tell you, for example, um, somebody with Lou Gehrig's disease or AOS um, may not be a candidate for speak out the traditional way. They do better speaking with intent, but the exercises would be too intense for them and would, uh, would fatigue them. So we wouldn't do that. Also, intent may not be the best thing for multiple sclerosis. Sound, the voice might sound worse. So the best way, what we say is, come in, um, if the diagnosis is PD, even if there are other diagnoses along with that, come in, let us do the evaluation and perform the stimulability testing, and we'll know right away whether or not speak out would help. Okay, perfect. Um, because I think some people probably watching have some type of Parkinson's Plus syndrome. Um, a lot of people find their way to us. Yeah, Parkinson Plus, yes. It, it will be effective for that. Yes, he Progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, CBD, Lewy body dementia. Yes, they can benefit from Speak Out. They're going to have a harder time maintaining it, so they really need good family support and a loud crowd. Okay, perfect. Great answer. I love this. This is so good. Thank you guys for staying tuned. We've got um, Amy Lindberg, who I believe is watching from um, a support group. Um, her comment takes up a lot of the screen, so I'll leave it up for just a second. But um, she's asking about core strengthening at the gym. Does ab work improve diaphragmatic breathing to some extent? And if so, um, if so, working one's abdominal muscles could help postpone some associated problems with speech. So it sounds like someone has told her at some point that core strengthening will help with breathing. So. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you for your question, Amy. I'm going to hide it yeah. now. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there are any studies done on that that it would postpone it. The thing that makes me think about it is because Parkinson's is characterized by the smaller movements, we also have to be exercising the lips and the tongue. So even though if somebody took a deep breath, they don't have the vocal capacity and they're not articulating. So I'm, I'm sure that could help the breathing, especially when I say that that's the main issue with the speech, but it's a combination of all of it working together. So I don't know. I don't, it can't be bad for you for sure, but I don't know <laughs> that it would prevent the rest of it. You know, we need the rest of the system, but the most important is the breathing. Everything without the breathing, you can't do the rest of it. I don't right. Know, I don't know yes. Yeah, no, that's a that's great feedback, definitely. All right, we've got Paul Cordell um, who asked about hiccups, and I have no idea what the answer to this is, but I'm having episodes of hiccups much more often, question mark. Have you heard of that? Is that something that you can give insight into? Okay. If not, we can skip it. I may have had one or two patients with problems with hiccups, but I don't think they're related to the PD or maybe it could be medicine. I, I don't know. I'm sorry, Paul. It's okay. Yep. You can ask the questions. There's just no guarantee that we're going to answer all of them accurately. He also asked about yoga for breathing. Um, kind of the same. You... Uh, we need to work the entire speech and swallowing mechanism. Okay. Maybe that would help with the uh, diaphragmatic breathing, but in order to speak better, we've got to work the whole system. So it's not just the breathing. You see, when we do the counting, when I talk about counting in terms of um, re-coordinating the breathing pattern, we're not just breathing, we're talking. We're throwing the voice over, we're moving the lips and the tongue besides taking a deep breath. So it's about the whole system. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been really amazing. Um, thank you so much for stopping by um, and answering our questions. This has been one of the topics that has been most requested from our community. And so if you're watching and you still have questions, you still have comments, 
um, put them in the comment section below. Um, we'll make sure to keep an eye on them um, and see what resources we can provide you if we haven't answered your questions already. And um, again, Samantha, thank you so much for being here. Um, is there a place that people can go to learn more about what you do? We've plugged it many times, but give us again your website and maybe how people can connect with you guys on social media. Yeah, definitely. So the website is parkinsonvoiceproject.org. You go to our website, there's a tab, this is patients and families. So you can learn about Speak Out in the Loud crowd and look up to see if there's a Speak Out provider in your area. If there's not, give us a call. Um, also, under the Education and Events tab, they can register for, uh, for the lecture that we're going to be live streaming. And you can also look down because all the recordings, we started offering these lectures in April of 2017. The recordings of all of the past lectures are there now. So, for example, Tim May uh, um, spoke last month. He's a big fan of yours, by the way. I love Tim. We'll just geek out all day if we hang out together. Yeah. Fine. Tim's great. Speaking, we just had uh, Dr. Nav Kavasia from Dallas. He spoke this last Saturday on Parkinson's medications. I think he does a really good job of explaining them in his video. This recording will be up in a week, but there's also one um, understanding Parkinson's and the power of intent. That is when I spoke at the Parkinson's lecture series, and we'll talk all about, a lot about what we talked about today. Yeah, I've watched that one. It's a really, really good one. Um, I recommend you guys check out as many that interest you. And um, if you are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's or you've been on your Parkinson's journey for a while, um, I also want to invite you to check out the free PDF checklist that I have. Um, you know, speech therapy, physical therapy, these are all parts of a bigger plan of attack. You know, when you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, it can feel like everyone's telling you to go to speech therapy, go to physical therapy, you know, have this medicine, eat these foods, and it can be really overwhelming and confusing. And so putting it all together in a plan of attack that makes sense for you is crucial for your sanity really going forward. So I created a free PDF checklist that um, helps you lay the foundation of what a plan of attack should include. And it should include speech therapy, it should include physical therapy, but that'll help give you a good foundation of what to include in your plan of attack. And it's free over at invigoratept.com slash checklist. And it's yours, um, yeah, to download and read. And it's full of, um, talks about exercise, nutrition, we talk about medication um, and mindset. And it's all about hope and empowering and living with intent like, Samantha has been talking about um, for the last hour and a half. Thank you so much for staying on with me. So um, if you guys liked this broadcast, give us a thumbs up. Let us know in the comment section below. Samantha and I would love to hear from you. And please share it with at least one other person um, who could benefit from knowing about speech therapy for Parkinson's. Um, you could most literally save their life if they're having trouble um, swallowing. It's, it's um a service that you're providing to someone else who might be having trouble. Samantha, it looked like you were gonna pipe up when I said that. Was there something that you wanted to say? No, oh, it's just so important. But don't be afraid of it. Don't be of the, don't be afraid of the swallowing issue. Yeah. I love how proactive you are and positive. I always tell yeah. my my uh, loud crowd, you either manage Parkinson's or it manages you. So let's just manage it. I, I'm gonna go look up the checklist and uh, I'm gonna share it with my loud crowd this week. Perfect. It aligns perfectly with your uh, living with intent um, program that you have going there. So thank you guys all so much for watching. Samantha, thank you so much um, for joining us. And until we see you guys next time, keep moving. And I'm sending you lots and lots of big hugs. All right. Bye, guys.